think so. <laughs> Let's go to the book of Colossians, please. The book of Colossians. Excited about this message today. Last week we talked about the creation of the new man and uh, how that the creation of the new man in you is the only thing that's been created after the first six days. And that's a creation in Christ. Amen. Everything else you see is created in Adam in the first six days. And all be gone. When you look around you today, everything you see, every brick, every piece of wood, every tree is going to be devoured. The whole creation will be destroyed. You know what will last? The new creation. Those things created in Christ are the only things that will last after the judgment of God falls upon this creation. That's why it's important that a person is born again. Amen? That's how you defeat judgment. That's how you overcome condemnation. And so today we're going to look at another aspect of the new man, but I want to talk about the image of the new man or the character of the new man. In fact, the word image and the word character actually mean the same thing. It's something that's etched out. It's a stamp. And so when the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the express image of God, he is the exact stamp of God. When the Bible says that you are to be conformed to the image of Christ, you are to become someone that has got Christ's stamp on you where you actually replicate his character. Amen. And that's God's plan for your life. And so I want to talk about that. We're going to read back to verse number five of chapter three, and we're going to read to verse number 12. It says, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. And these are the characteristics of the lost, the characteristics of the world, uh, characteristics that you can possess them. Uh, you probably won't have a lifestyle of them, but you can do them and the Lord will discipline you for it. It goes on to say, for which things sake, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. And that wrath is not just talking about future eternal hell. It's talking about wrath in this day. Uh, we've heard about Noah's flood destroying the world. We've heard about Sodom and Gomorrah. That was the wrath of God coming down upon sin. And you will see it more and more in this world. <clears throat> God is not pleased with the wickedness of this world. He doesn't wink his eye at it. He does judge it, Amen. even in its present day. But of course, there is also the future wrath. It says, in which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication of your mouth, because what it's doing there, it's giving, you a, uh, it's giving you a flow. Anger, wrath, malice. Anger is a, uh, is a spirit of discontentment about a situation or thing you're going through. Wrath is a flash. It's a, it's a lashing out. Say, well, I just had enough. That's wrath. It's when you lose control. And something's, well, you know, that's just what I'm like. I just kind of snap. Well, no, it's your carnal and you were angry and you had a spirit of anger and now you're wrathful. And that's not a character trait that you can say this is intrinsically who I am, but it's a part of your old man. It's a part of your sin nature. Amen. Amen. Then it goes on to say malice. Malice is, a, is where someone not only has a spirit of anger, but we're, now they're strategizing how to hurt people and how to get back and how to make things hard on other people. That's malice. That's why in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, it says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Amen. So that's the old man. That's that's who we used to be. That old man is still in you. And if you feed him, he's going to show up. Amen. But the Bible says you're supposed to put him off like you would take the grave clothes off and put on the new man. And this is what it goes on to next here. It's, and then it goes on to lie, not one another. So you know it starts with the spirit. And then you start lashing out. 
And then it goes on to being a strategy of getting back and revenge. And then it comes out of the mouth. Blasphemy isn't just against God. Blasphemy, you can, have, you can, you can say blasphemous things about people you know. Whenever you say something about somebody that is not true to hurt their reputation because you have malice, that's blasphemy. So you can blaspheme your friends. <laughs> that's a pretty strong word and really puts it in its place. Amen. So be careful about that. Filthy communication. Uh, that's, you know, some people I wonder, you know, because they, they, it just seems they talk and it just comes out and it's all garbage. It's become such a natural flow from a corrupt heart that even their laughter is full of filthiness and even their good talk is full of filthiness and it's just filthy communication. And a Christian ought never be a part of that. Gossip is filthy communication. You've got to be careful of stuff like that. It says, filthy communication in your mouth, lie not one to another. Now you're twisting facts, twisting truths. And it says, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. And now we're going on to the new man. It says here, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, the, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Let me just go back here. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of of perfectness. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you, Lord, you would just guide and direct this message this morning. Give me power to preach. I pray it would uh, be something that would help change us. Oh, Lord, we need you today. Lord, we are so feeble without you, so powerless. Lord, we need you to meet with us and help us in this dire time in which you live. And Lord, encourage our hearts. Make us what you want us to be, Help us, Lord, to desire the fellowship of your sufferings and to know the power of your resurrection. I pray you bless now as we get into this message in Jesus' name. Amen. Notice in this first verse here when it talks about the new man, it says, put on the new man, in verse 10, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And we're going to get back to that, but I wanted to point out first in verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. In the Lord, as a new man, there is no nationality, Greek nor Jew. There are no creeds, circumcision or uncircumcision. Being a Jew or not a Jew is not an advantage or a disadvantage. <laughs> Amen. It means nothing. That is not what the Lord is wanting. There is no culture, barbarians and Scythians, no educated or uneducated. And that's what makes the difference. That doesn't make a difference. There's no class system, like in India, where they have the caste system, where you belong to a certain caste based on where you were born, no bond nor free. Whether you're a servant, whether you're a master, it doesn't matter when you are the new man. Amen? Think about that. This verse would really save the world a whole lot of trouble if they just read it. <laughs> you know, we wouldn't have all the issues that are going on today. What really matters is the new man. In Galatians 6, verse number 14, it says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. What matters is, is whether you've been made new, whether you're a new man, amen? 
You can say, I'm from here and I'm from there. You can say, I've got this much money or that much money. You can say, I've got this degree or that degree. You can say, well, I'm the boss around here and you're the servant. It doesn't matter to the Lord. To him, what matters is whether you're a new creature. Whether you've been born again, you're a new creature in Christ. Notice, it talks about the elect of God. I'm trying to find my verse again. In verse 12, it says, Put on therefore as the elect of God. A lot of people refer to the elect as those that are chosen to be saved. <laughs> uh, folks, that is not true. We are not Calvinists here. And I believe Calvin, uh, John Calvin was wrong. He was not right in his doctrine. Anybody that believes in it is wrong. God does not choose people to be saved against their will. God does not choose people to be damned against their will. God wills everybody to be saved. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Being a part of the elect of God is being a part of what God had planned for you since the foundation of the world. And when he looks at you, you're a part of the elect. And what are you elected to become? You're elected to become like his son. That's a part of the elect. You're a part of, you're, you are actually predestined to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, I'm a long way from that today. <laughs> well, of course we all are. <laughs> We're all measuring here. Here's Jesus Christ and here we are. And here maybe I am, and there you are, and there's somebody else. And we're saying, oh, look, I'm more like Jesus than you are. But we're all quite a ways off yet. <laughs> Amen. And, and one day the Bible says when he comes again, we will see him as he is, and we will be like him. Which means in a, in a moment of time, our salvation will become complete at the resurrection. And our soul will automatically be brought up to the level of Christ and we'll, we'll enjoy the fullness of Christ, all of us at the same time. Amen? It's ringing a little bit here, son. I don't know if you can hear that. I can. And so that's God's plan for you, to become like Christ. Well, you say, if I'm going to become like Christ ultimately anyways, why bother trying? <laughs> well, the first thing is this. It's not a matter of bother trying. It's a matter of if you're born again, you can't help but try. You want to be like Jesus. Now, if you don't want to be like Jesus, there's something wrong with your Christianity. Now, you may struggle and you may have sins and you may have issues and habits and you're, they're giving you a hard time. And in fact, your conviction and your correction that God has put in your life is proof of how you are a child of God. Amen? If you weren't a child of God, you wouldn't care, nor would you be corrected, because he doesn't correct the devil's children. He corrects his own. Amen? So if you feel bad about the way you are and your deficiencies, that just means that you know him a little bit. <laughs> Amen? And the more you know him, the more deficiencies you will see in yourself. And I'm a little concerned about people that think they've arrived. All I know is there's something wrong with their Christianity because they have not seen Christ. Because the moment you see him, you also have revealed to you the gap between him and you. The same way Isaiah, when he saw God uh, high and lifted up, immediately he looked at himself, whoa, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. Before that, he was feeling pretty good until he saw God. Folks, the closer you become to the Lord, the more you realize how deficient you really are. And folks, if you think you've come somewhere, get closer to God and you'll be humbled very quickly. And that's a state we ought to live in as believers in a state of humility before our God. Lowliness of mind. Amen. Amen. So we want to. The Bible says... If you have this hope in you, you want to be pure, even as he is pure. You know him, and Lord, you are pure, and that's why I picked that hymn today, Oh, to be like me, oh, to be like him. Pure as thou art. Folks, we should desire it. Do you desire 
in your heart to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. That, my friend, is the new man crying out in you, saying, please let me live. Let me live through you. Let my life be seen. That is the new man that's been created in you wanting to live. And you've got to peel away the old man and peel away the things that's keeping him under the wraps. Amen? That old man has to be crucified. I love one passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. If you've never read chapter 3 and chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, I would suggest do a study through it. And it will bless your heart. But right at the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, there's a very powerful couple of verses here. And this is what it says. Now the Lord is that spirit. So he's a spirit. And the spirit of Christ is now in you if you're born again. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, Mm -hmm. freedom. Amen? Liberty. So a Christian, if you're in bondage, you know what's going on. There's a part of your life that the Lord has not been allowed to uh, infiltrate or intrude into to help you deal with that. Because the moment you let Christ deal with your issues is the moment you find liberty. And that's why the Bible says the truth shall make you free. And Christ is the truth. And he is the word. We're talking about the scripture. We're talking about truth coming into all areas of your life. Notice what it says here next. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord is the essence or the weight of God, the substance of God. So when we're talking about God's glory, We're talking about his weight or his substance. This is what he is subsides of. This is what he is made up of. So the Lord has a lot of glory. (laughs) He's heavy, amen. He tips the scales when it comes to glory. There's a lot of great things about him. That's why even Moses couldn't withstand seeing God face to face because the Bible says if you'd see my whole glory, you would die. So he put him in a cleft of a rock and he put his hand over him. He says, I'll I'll show you my hinder parts. I'll show you the rear parts of who I am. And that was enough to cause his face to shine when he went to talk to the Israelites. He had to put a veil over his face. And by the way, that's what 2 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about. That glory that came upon Moses and that was the glory of the law. And the Bible says, how much greater is this glory? that we have now when Christ is in us. The Spirit of the Lord is in us and now we have liberty in our souls. Not just an external view of God, but we have God internally. This is fabulous. You talk about the shining of Moses' face. Christian, do you understand the glory that could be seen through your life if Jesus Christ will have control of who you are? It's fabulous. <laughs> this is what this world needs today. It needs Christians like that. And that's why the Bible says one day, <laughs> unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his glory. Yeah. Can you imagine that? No more cleft of the rock, no more hand over the eyes. He says, in Christ, you can face all the glory of God head on. See, right now, you're not getting all the glory of God. But let me ask you this. Where are you getting this glory? Where are you seeing it today? Well, you're seeing it in Christ. See, Jesus is the image of God. The new man is created after the image of him that created him. That means that the creation of the new man is after the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is after the image of his Father because he is God. All the glory that was in the Father is in the Son because the Bible says that he is full of glory and truth. And now that glory has been passed down to us through the new man. 
But my question is, what is this weight? What is this essence? What is this uh, substance that's supposed to reveal that the new man is actually living through my life? Well, that's what he's demonstrating here in this passage. It says, 2 Corinthians, I'm going to read that last verse again. But we all with open face beholding as in the glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Yeah. You get what that means now? <laughs> that means as a child of God indwelt by the spirit of God, when you behold the glory of God, you get transformed or changed into that image. Not just by reading the Bible. I'm talking about the knowledge of participation where you're saying, Lord, I want this in my life and you submit yourself to it. It changes you. It changes you. And you find all those elements within Christ, within Jesus Christ. The new man in you is basically Jesus Christ in you. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the what? Glory of God. Yeah. Notice how he used the word glory there. Not the perfection, not the holiness, not this, that, or the other. But he says, you've come short of the glory. The weight. Well, who's the glory? The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the brightness of his glory. For all have sinned and come short of Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's our sin. That's our condemnation. Our condemnation is that we're not like Jesus. <laughs> and so in salvation, when Jesus saved us, he saved us to become like his son. Salvation is becoming like Jesus. It's not just saying, oh, I prayed a prayer. Salvation is a process in the mind of God where he says, I'm going to take this sinner, this worm in the dirt, yeah. and he is going to be like my son. That's the mind of God. It's not just, oh, pray this prayer so you can squirm around the dirt a little more. <laughs> Salvation to God is to make you like his son. Yeah, amen. And that's what makes you the elect. Because the moment you receive Christ as your Savior, you are predestined to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That is your final destination. <laughs> Amen. But here we are in the nasty now and now. <laughs> We're in the terrible place where our bodies and our sinful souls have such influence on our lives and we have to somehow work ourselves through these problems and their, our issues and our, our emotions and all these things. So he says, what I want you to do to become effective to me in the time that I've left you down there while your salvation is being completed is to allow you to take on my son glory to glory. And you can be changed, glory to glory. <laughs> so, when we're looking at the characteristics of the new man, what we're looking at are characteristics of Christ. Yeah. What we're doing when we're looking at the character, the lists in the Bible that tells you this is what the new man is, this is what you ought to do, we're looking at the glory of Christ. Now you can look at that and say, oh, that's a neat preacher and read the, yeah, yeah, I read that. Or you can look at that and say, God, that you would make me like that. And you would open up your heart and allow him to change you. That's why I preach this. Not so you can get a list of definitions of what this word means. So that when it says bowels of mercy... Oh, dear God, that I could have mercy on people. Yeah. That I could share the same mercy Jesus Christ had for me. And I could show that to the lost. And those that hurt me, 
See, that's where Christ shines. That's where the new man lives. Amen? Amen. And on the contrary, your bitterness, your anger, your lashing out is antichrist. It's antichrist. Your malice is antichrist. Your destroying people's reputation is antichrist. The old man. The mercy is a new man. Amen. So I want to go through this. And by the way, when Jesus um, told Peter to go fishing and, and he would find that coin in the mouth of the fish and he was paying his debt, they said, well, should we pay taxes? Then Jesus said, whose inscription or superscription is on that coin? And well, they said Caesar's. Well, he says, give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. And give unto God that which is God's. See, we're talking about the image. See, there's a superscription on you too. Christ stamped himself on you. That's the new man. Give unto God that which is God's. Give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. It's funny how some people give up the plan of becoming like Christ for money. (laughs) You know what we are by the image we bear. 1 John 2, 29 says, You know that he is righteous. You know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Amen. Amen. Maybe you don't know what exactly righteous is, but you desire righteousness. You want to do right if you're a born-again Christian. So let's look, number one, at the goodness of the new man. The goodness. I'm going to give you a couple of of these characteristics here, and then we'll go to another point. Bowels of mercies. This really is compassion. In 1 John 3, 17, it says, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? That means that needs of people should bring out in the believer a heart of compassion. When we see people suffering, in us immediately is a desire, somehow, how can I be a help? Now, I'm not saying that every time you see somebody that has a need, that you ought to be the one to fill the need. But you ought to be the one that wants to. Sometimes there's people you can't give them money. (laughs) Sometimes there's things you got to stay away from. But all I know is this, if you're a child of God and the new man is in you, when you see somebody hurting, you want to help them. That's bowels of mercy. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ was. He gave us so many examples of this. Remember Matthew 9, verse 9 to 13? It talks about how Jesus sat down with the sinners and the publicans. It says, and Jesus passed forth forth from thence, He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom and he saith unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in his house, in in Matthew's house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. So in other words, Jesus saw this sinner, this greedy individual that usually ripped off his own people for his own good, and everybody hated them, Jesus went to this one and said, Matthew, follow me. Now his earlier disciples are looking at him and saying, you crazy? These are tax collectors. Why do you want them with us? They're not worthy. Jesus said, follow me. Later on, he's sitting down with, with Matthew at his table, and they're eating together which is perfect. I mean, that's what you ought to do. Matthew is following. He is doing what he ought to do, and Jesus is teaching him at his table. Many publicans and sinners came. They said, wow, 
who is this holy man that would come to us as sinners, as hated people, and accept us and then come and sit with us? Yeah. When the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, yeah. hey. but they that are sick. Then he goes on to say this, But go ye and learn what that meaneth. Yeah. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I'm not call, come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Yeah. He says, I will have mercy. <laughs> when he looked at Matthew, he says, oh, it's a sick man. The Pharisees looked at, oh, it's a sinner. Let's stay away. Jesus says, he's sick. Matthew, let me help you. That's mercy. Amen. Did he deserve it? Folks, if it's mercy, you don't deserve it. If you've ever needed mercy, it's because you didn't deserve it. Yeah. The reason why Jesus showed you mercy to save your soul was because you didn't deserve it. If you deserved it, you wouldn't need any mercy. Mercy is the expression of the heart of love of God to sinners to find a way to bring them back to himself. Without mercy, there would be no salvation. Yeah. Folks, you want to reach people, you better learn mercy. Bowels of mercy. Compassion for people. I'm not saying just go all emotional here. <laughs> I know there's, a, there's a, a Christianity mindset. Oh, yeah, we just love everything. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying truly seeing the sickness. Saying we need to help this person. And sometimes the medication is not pleasant to take. Yeah. Amen. But because there's mercy, you give it. <laughs> you understand that? I think most people today, what they do is when they want to help people, <laughs> they're not doing it to help people. They're doing it so that they like them. They're doing it so that people will think well of you. See, look how good of a Christian I'm being. No. If you're doing right by people, you know what? There is the potential that they will begin to hate you. I've never gotten over that in the ministry, how that you give out so many hours and hours to people and they turn on you in a dime. Just, whew, and they try to tear you down, try to hurt you and your family. And all you ever want to do is care about them. Oh, that old devil. <laughs> but you know what that sometimes gets us to do? Well, if that's the way people are going to be, then I'm not going to help anybody. <laughs> Jesus walked the Golgotha Road knowing I'm going to die at the end. Every person you help, you're sticking your neck out. They may just cut. But you know what you do anyways? Stick your neck out. <laughs> that's what mercy is. That's the new man. And that's where you have to say, Lord, I see this in you. I see what you do for these people. The mercy you show towards them and I want, Lord, I would like your spirit to change me and make me merciful. Amen? That's being conformed to the image of Christ. And if you can perceive that glory today, and it may not come through this message, but as you meditate on this and as you think about it and read in the scriptures, it will slowly, that word will change you and free your soul where that mercy will come out. And you begin to show mercy to the lost and mercy to people that hate you. Usually people hate me. Okay. <laughs> you know, but to show them mercy if they hate you. That's what Jesus did. The new man in the image of Christ seeks to help those in sin and therefore comes to them in mercy, not in judgment. Folks, you don't need to judge anything. You know why? What's judged has been judged. What you say makes no difference. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. We, sometimes in our anger, we, well, you're going to get this. For that. So what? 
What does it make a difference whether you say that or not? That's not going to help them. Amen? Go to them in mercy. They may reject it. <laughs> but that's what the new man would do. The Bible says in James 2 verse 8, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. For if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. In other words, you can go up to somebody and say, oh, you're doing wrong, ha, huh? and think you're better. It's very easy for them to look back at you and find something you've done wrong too. You're not better. You're not better than them. There is no help for anybody until you realize how low you really are. And if you think that you've got what it takes to be a help, that's all that will be helping them is you. But if you humble yourself before God, and see this person with need and realize that their need is much like your need, but you want God to use you, you'll say, Lord, I'm just like them. I don't know how you can use me, but Lord, I want to help these people. See, that's why the Bible says he giveth grace unto the humble. Grace, it's a grace that works through you, that empowers you to do what you need to do for those people, but it's not you and your goodness. It's not your talent. It's not your ability. It's not your family line. It's not your culture. It's not where you came from. None of those things will help that person. You've got to be empty. Empty. I'm nothing, God. All I've got in me is a desire to be like Christ. Christ. And that Christ in me looks at this person with compassion. And I can do nothing, God. He says, let me give you the power. Let me give you the grace. Amen? Amen. That's what mercy is. Mercy is just the potential for grace. And then you have, my goodness, it's 12, 11. I'll give you one more. Kindness, this is gentleness. This is the expression of grace. So you have the, mercy is the potential for grace, but then you have kindness, which is, which is grace expressed to people. So your bad attitude has nothing to do with grace. <laughs> Amen. In Titus 3, verse 3, it says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Lord that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. See, it says there that this is what we were until what? What appeared? Kindness and love. You were foolish, disobedient, serving your lusts and pleasures, living in malice. That means if you had an opportunity to make somebody look bad, you'd do it. Envying what people have, their position on the job, their paycheck, the amount they get paid per hour. Envy in your heart. Hateful, hating one another. But after the kindness and the love of God appeared. 
Think about that. You're meeting people every day that are those things that you used to be. What changed you was kindness. What's going to change them? <laughs> you know why you got saved? Because God was kind to you. You want that new man to be used in you? You want to, be, you want to become like Christ? You've got to learn to be kind. Well, this is this way I've always been. <laughs> well, yeah, it says that right there. It used to be sometimes foolish and disobedient. That is how you've always been. We're not talking about what you've always been. We're talking about the new man. We're talking about someone that used to live in sin and wickedness and now is used by God to do great things for him and to touch people's lives. That's a new man. Don't give me this stuff. Well, that's just not who I am. Folks, if you want to stay who you are, you shouldn't have gotten saved. A born again believer changes. And Christ wells up in his life and, and that new man reaches out and has compassion and that new man has kindness towards people. Amen? I know they may be a dirty scoundrel. Why don't you try it? You want to reach that person? He's only going to be reached through the grace of God. The grace of God is the kindness working through you. You go to that person and be kind. Jesus was kind. He was kind to us. He was kind to children. They weren't just a nuisance to him. The disciples said, the disciples said kids, get out of here. You're in the way. Jesus says, suffer not. <laughs> suffer the children to come unto me, he says, and forbid them not, he says. And the Bible says he was much displeased. You know, it's the only time in the Bible where it tells you that Jesus was much displeased is when they turned the children away. <laughs> it's because he was kind. He was kind to kids. I want to encourage you, don't neglect these little ones. You see them, stop. Show them kindness. You want to win them for Christ? You want them to go on and do great things for God? They're only going to change through kindness. You got co-workers, I'm sorry, your filthy attitude is not going to reach them. But your kindness will. I have a testimony on the back table about a woman in Papua New Guinea that was uh, involved in Satanism. And the missionaries over there, Bob Jackson and his wife, their son is now pastoring in Edmonton. And he's the one that wrote, this is his mother's um, testimony, but he published that for her. And it's there for you to take if you want a copy. She, she won that woman that was involved in sat Satanism by going to her while her mother was sick, when the whole, when everybody would forsake them, she went and take fish and rice and she went and fed them because they couldn't feed themselves. And she did that the whole time she was, this woman was taking care of her mother. And after that, that woman started coming to their church and got saved. And, after that, and just read it, it's just fantastic. And that uh, woman, and she could never even communicate with her because the language was different, but they had a relationship <laughs> even though they couldn't speak to one another. And through an interpreter, she was born again and one day, one weekend, uh, while they were trying to get to her to bring her medicine, she had passed away. But before she did, this woman gathered all of her old friends around her deathbed and pleaded for them to receive Christ. And many got saved through her death. Where did that all start? Through the kindness the kindness and love of God. Oh, that's what this world needs more than ever. <laughs> Folks, you want that new man to be powerful in your life? You've got to decide to be kind to people. 
have mercy, look at them and have that compassion well up inside of you. When Jesus saw the multitudes coming out of Samaria, his disciples were saying, Jesus, why were you talking to that Samaritan woman? And at the same time, Jesus is looking out and the Bible says that he was moved with compassion. And he looked to the man and he says, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. Look upon the fields for they're white, all ready to harvest. And yet they were looking down at the world, at their, at their, petty, uh, their, their petty prejudices they had with Samaritans. And he says, lift up your eyes from this earth. Lift up your eyes and see the souls. Hey, let that compassion well up in you. That's got to be step number one. If you have no compassion, you'll do nothing for God. Next to compassion, when you see them, go to them and be kind. Well, I'm just the kind of person that says what's on their mind. Then stop being so stupid. <laughs> That's a negative, by the way. <laughs> That's not a positive thing. And I surely wouldn't be proud of it. Because what you're saying is, before you say things, you don't meditate upon the truth of what you're thinking about, and you're saying things that may very well be wrong. So don't be proud of that. <laughs> That's a very carnal thing to do. <laughs> Everything you say as a child of God ought to be filtered through the truth of the Word of God. And the Bible says, a wise man keepeth his peace. It's even a fool is counted wise when he holdeth his peace, the Bible says. That means even if you're a fool, just shut up and they'll think you're smart. <laughs> you understand that? <laughs> Say, wow, there's my ticket. <laughs> I've used it many times in my life. <laughs> Quiet people are thought of to be very smart. <laughs> Amen. Be like Christ. Let's bow our heads. And we'll go through more of these next week. We'll keep preaching, keep teaching. It's a lot of work to be done in our lives. If you're born again here today, you're a disciple. You're a disciple of Christ. That means you're a learner from the master, from the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're seeking to become like your master. Except it's not just about knowledge. It's not just about what you look like. It's about your character. What's stamped on your heart? Maybe it's time to put away some petty issues in your life, some petty bitterness or unforgiveness or anger. Maybe the way you've been speaking and maybe you need to confess that before the Lord and ask for forgiveness and cleansing. Say, Lord, put mercy in my heart. Oh, that I could have compassion. Make me kind, Lord. Make me kind. 